Uh, my plan for today is we will uh, continue on with some of the stuff we did last time, although I think I'm going to first jump into talking about the assignment two. Um, but uh, yeah, if anybody has, hopefully everybody's at least started, has looked at it, started working on it. Um, I did also talk about that last time. Uh, at least the workflow a little bit on the assignment too, so maybe I'll get a little bit into the actual stuff to be done. Um, um, it was working. I, I remember I, I was thinking that there might have been a problem, but I think everything's working, so I don't know uh, in, in terms of making a commit and pushing it up there, the auto grader running, stuff like that. So I haven't checked if people um, uh, have been pushing commits or not, or but uh, let me know if, if anybody's been having uh, issues figuring it out or uh, seeing whether um, your tests and stuff are working for the assignment. Um, let me let me go ahead and uh, open up my Jupyter notebook here. Let's see. Um, let's start with this here. So, uh, last time we had, we hadn't quite gotten through all of the, um, uh, the, the stuff from Unit 3 last time. Um, I'll try and maybe see, go for that last one, the, the one where we went through actually training a model a little bit. But I did first want to, there was also another one about using SK, Scikit-Learn, and Stats Model. Um, so I mentioned that last time, but I didn't show it. Uh, but um, yeah, it, you know, there's some stuff in here that um, um, you will maybe need to familiarize yourself with before you can do the assignment. Because yeah, I, I didn't. We haven't really talked about using Scikit-Learn to do like a linear regression or logistic regression yet. Um, there is an example of it doing a, a, a classification using. Uh, something in the, the chapter three here, so building a model. But um, but yeah, for the assignment, I did ask you to do like a linear regression using both scikit-learn and stats model and a logistic regression. Um, and you know, we're going to talk more in detail about both of those uh, coming up in the class. So we'll spend some time, especially like on linear and logistic regression. So, but basically, all we're really doing on this assignment is just um, I, I want you to kind of get familiar with the basics of loading a data set, cleaning it a little bit, and then fitting a model to it. Right. So, so we'll fit a regression model, which means in this case we're going to be fitting a line to a set of data for the assignment, um, and fit a logistic regression, which is actually a model that does classification. So we'll be fitting a model to predict um, for the assignment to predict whether it's going to rain or not based on the two features I asked you to use for that one. So um, um, I thought I would mention you know, this notebook. Uh, and there's a couple of other things, like um, I think I asked you to show the decision boundary or the line. Uh, so I want to maybe talk a little bit about some of that stuff that you need to be able to do for the, the second assignment. Um, so if you've read, if you've looked at this this notebook, the fourth one that I had for the the unit three, really kind of the previous week, um, um, we covered most of the stuff I think. So you know, in this class, in practical terms, you should mostly be thinking of we're usually going to be using a data frame or a NumPy array that's two dimensional, which has a set of, of inputs that we use to train a model with. Canonically, we'll call that X. So so that's just our input features. Where the column, so if we have five features, we'll have five columns in that table or that array, uh, like we have here, right? So that, and, and we usually would label that as in features or the number of features. Uh, and we'll have multiple samples. Um, so every um, sample uh, is a row in our table. Um, and we're, we're doing supervised learning for two-thirds of this course, actually for longer in this course. So what that means is we have to have uh, a set of targets or a set of labels that we're going to train our model to predict, uh, train our model with. Right? So for regression targets, those will be real valued numbers usually, like the price of the house or um, 
for our um, assignment two, what was the, the, so there was some weather data and you were asked to predict, uh, we'll see, I'll bring it up, I think the temperature or something. So anyway, uh, the, the first one was a regression. And if it's a classification, those should be some sort of a, um, 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 a uh, categorical label. So like for binary classification, it'll be zero or one or yes, no. And that's what we do for the assignment two. For the, the second part where you're doing a categorization, um, you have to predict whether it's going to rain or not based on a, a yes-no label that we have. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, just keep that in mind. That's basically, uh, we'll be doing that over and over, right? So we build a model. We have this idea of our inputs um, and our targets or our labels uh, that we're going to train the model to try and predict. So, um, So um, there was an example in chapter in, in the chapter that we were working on the previous week of fitting a model. I think we did some like random forest or something, or the textbook did uh, in order to fit a um, 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 a regression model to that set of data um, for the house prices. Um, so it specifically, um, 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 uh, if you looked at this notebook, uh, we're going through fitting a linear regression. Um, on some housing data and uh, a logistic regression on, on a similar set of data. Right? Um, so this, this is different data than the one we use in the textbook, so this is a little bit simpler, but we've got what, um, um, looking at the scribe here, we've got actual house prices of individual houses in this case. Um, um, and I'm wrong. I guess maybe I'm using the same data here in this, this notebook. So again, we have like the average income, similar stuff that like we did um, last week. Um, although it's a smaller data set. So um, this is showing after we load it in here uh, that we have 5,000. So, so it looks like all there's no missing data here, at least for the, the columns we ended up describing. So these are the numeric columns. So we've got the average area income again, the, the, the average age of the house, um, and we're going to be trying to predict the house price or the average house price that we have here um, using a regression. So, uh, but we've only got 5,000 uh, data here, uh, 5,000 samples uh, in this data set here to use. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I asked this before. If, if you read this in a data frame, so for the second assignment, I ask you to do some similar things. So kind of uh, do a little bit of data exploration. So the simplest kinds of things you can do is figure out what features you have and um, uh, whether there's anything missing or not. Um, so the info here, you know, but yeah, again, I encourage you to, you know, not skip over these. So the, the data type, especially pay attention to stuff that gets loaded in as an object. You might do something with that. Uh, but, um, but yeah, in this example, we probably don't do anything with the address. We just don't use that as a feature um, here. But the rest of these are all kind of numeric, and they all got loaded in as floats, and we didn't have any missing data. Um, so yeah, in this example, so normally the what you want to train with, you are going to have to have everything as some sort of numeric value. So even the categorical data ultimately has to be encoded as like an integer, or maybe using a one-hot encoding, which um, we mentioned a little bit last time. We didn't show that, but. Um, in this case, to do the simplest thing, just, just so we can give an example of doing a linear regression with, with scikit-learn, uh, we're just going to ignore the, the, the price is the, th the thing we want to predict. So we need to remove that uh, out of our training data. So that, that's uh, more of a common problem than you might think, but uh, you'll, you'll occasionally find people, like a paper or something, where they actually had the data, the labels, uh, in the data that they trained with. Uh, maybe maybe hidden a little bit or modified, they didn't realize it, but, but, uh, but yeah, you know, of course, that, that makes it an easy problem if, if the actual thing you're trying to predict is in your training data, um, but you won't get a very good model in that case. So, so anyway, we don't want that price, and we're just not going to use the address here. So. Um, 
So yeah, like you have to do for the first part when you do a linear regression, you should just use the the, the, the straightforward linear regression object from Scikit-Learn. Um, I think that uh, you should just use it with no uh, with the, all the default parameters. So we'll have to talk about this some more, but you can modify how any of these models work by changing the the, the meta parameters that you pass in. So we'll be doing this for. Uh, specifying the amount of regularization um, or other kinds of parameters. Um, so, um, and I do encourage you to, you know, learn to use the help system. So, for example, uh, once I've run this notebook, I should be able to, uh, let's say, bring up the contextual help. Um, And um, so those things should have worked. You do have to, you know, have run those cells for that that contextual help to uh, bring up the, the the Python documentation uh, for the thing. So I thought I'd run this, but I guess not. I might just rerun everything above that. So. Um, so I'll run everything above that. So here we're just creating our model object. So yeah, I mean, once you've once you've actually run the cells, uh, the contextual help should work, usually. So, um, so in this case, the basic uh, linear regression. You know, these are the, the kinds of things that you can uh, specify. Um, and uh, to tell you the truth, I thought there were some more, but um, but but yeah, so stuff you can I input into it, the whether to fit the intercept or not. Um, I'll, I'll come back and mention that. Um, so by default for the scikit-learn linear regression, um, it, uh, it, it has this parameter to true, which really means that it um, is using uh, a, it, it creates a dummy variable for you for the intercept feature. You don't have to add in that by hand uh, like you do for stats model. So, um, But, but yeah, so I thought there was more here, but uh, for our assignment, yeah, you, you can probably just use the, you should use the linear regression with no, with the default, so you don't have to specify any parameters here. Um, so when you fit a model, um, so this is the pattern, no matter what kind of a model you're using, you'll basically always do that. So you'll, you'll create your model, a linear regression, or a, um, um, a random forest, or a support vector machine, whatever your model is. You'll, you'll create an instance of it, and then you'll just do a fit. And this is really training the model, right? So you're passing in your two dimensional, should be two dimensional array, should be all numeric of the input features you want to train with. Um, and if it's a regression, you'll pass in um, a one dimensional vector of the um, of, of the real valued numbers that you want to uh, make a model that would uh, predict on here. This does have to be like a vector shaped, so you might have to reshape this on your assignment depending on how you do things. Um, so, for example, uh, the way we have it right right now is it's a one dimensional vector with five thousand items in there. Um, so, if uh, we ended up with um, Um, if we ended up with something that was um, um, uh, uh, like a two-dimensional with 5,000 rows and one column, uh, yeah, I, get, I, guess I can't do that on a Panda's uh, data frame, so... So here I just use the values attribute, which actually returns it as a NumPy array. So I know a NumPy array, I can reshape like that. Um, and I'll sign the value back in there for my Y. So now, you know, I've, I've, I've got a NumPy array. Uh, 
but um, the uh, the oh, um, I shouldn't referee run that cell. So now, now it's an umpire array. I can't do that anymore. But um, um, anyway, um, um, yeah, I mean, I can't learn uh, well happily nowadays except pandas data frames, uh, which is what we did the first time I did that. Or we'll take numpy arrays, right? But yeah, in this case. Um, um, The um, oh, hmm. yeah, I guess it's happy with that. So sometimes though, you have to be careful about the shape. Um, so if it if it asks you if it complains about you have the wrong shape object, you might have to reshape that to get it uh, to work uh, for your targets there. I thought it had to be like a vector, so I was a little bit surprised that worked. But uh, anyway, um, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, But let's uh, let's rerun that again. So and let's fit it again with just the original data, with the original um, data frame and series that we had loaded uh, here. Um, okay. So yeah, I mean a, a lot of like the first task is, is really just point out these parameters. So this is really kind of some of the same stuff you have to do to get the first test to, to pass. But uh, most of the stuff that we do in this class, we think of once you fit or train a model that there's a set of, um, of, of, um, of coefficients uh, that have been trained. So um, I'm skipping ahead here. We'll, we'll talk more about linear regressions, but what happens for this data um, is we will get um, um, actually we'll get multiple co we'll get an intercept parameter um, and we'll get multiple coefficients I only showed one but in this case since X um, had uh, how many features does X have here let me see So since X has five features, um, I should end up with one coefficient, one model fitted parameter for each one of the features, plus uh, a sixth one for the uh, intercept. Um, so there's uh, um, actually, uh, in this set of coefficients, there should be five of them, one for each feature. Uh, um, when you do it for your, uh, your um, assignment we're fitting only with one feature for the first part so you should only have one coefficient and then the intercept parameter um, so um, I wanted to mention I, I thought I had an example of it in here, but um, um, for the assignment, I, th I think I did ask you to uh, show the resulting, so to visualize the resulting fit of the line. Um, uh, so the way to do that, um, so, so I'll, I'll just uh, kind of tell you, is you can think of that slope and the intercept for the assignment as values for the, the, a line, uh, for the equation of a line. Uh, so this is our kind of the standard equation of a line. So again, I'm sorry, I really thought I had this in here, but uh, to, to visualize that line, you can, you can easily do it by hand, where uh, the slope uh, is going to be uh, that, the coefficient. So if you only have one feature, you only have one coefficient. Uh, and, and that coefficient, of course, for a linear regression, of course, co corresponds to the slope of the fitted line that you that your model ends up fitting for your data. Uh, and then the, the B is the intercept term in, in this um, equation here. So the the uh, the intercept parameter will tell you the value. Uh, it's your model dot uh, 
coefficient underscore and model dot intercept underscore is giving you a parameter. So if you do that, if you plot that for some range of values for your x, so that would be your input feature, uh, you'll be able to see what your fitting line is. So of course, this isn't a line, really. It only need two points. So you can plot this up when x is 0, figure out what the y is, and, and when x is you know, whatever the end range is for your data, and, and, and plug it in, uh, figure out what the y to get a line so you can visualize what your fitted line was. So anyway, I, I think I did ask you to do that on the assignment. So you do have to kind of understand what these are uh, in order to, by hand, um, visualize your line that got fit to the data when you're doing a regression. Okay. Uh, yeah, in this notebook, there's some other stuff in here. Uh, I didn't. Uh, w the next assignment, we will do some uh, actual train test split. Uh, you don't have to do that for this uh, second assignment that you should be working on right now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, um, basically this is what we, you would normally do. Um, you know, you wouldn't fit on all the data that you have. You would split it up um, and only fit on a portion of the data. So here we, we split up where uh, we use 70% of the data to train with and we kept back 30% uh, to, to test, to evaluate uh, how well our model is doing um, in this uh, example notebook here. Um, um, I, I and and I did also ask you to um, I think on the first part um, your fitted regression model gives some uh, metrics about how it's performing. Um, so you can ask things like this. So, so these, these tell you uh, the, the, the amount of error that your fitted model does to uh, the, the data that you're trying to predict, right? Um, and um, for your second assignment, you'll just uh, be doing these on all the data. So you're going to be training with all the data, and we're not going to do any kind of a split. Uh, and you can calculate the uh, mean squared error um, on all the data, right? So here, like a perfectly fitted model would have zero error. So if I gave you a set of data and asked you to fit a line where all the line exactly was on, where all the data was exactly on the line, there would be zero error. So when you calculate this mean squared error or root mean squared error, you'd get zero. But you, know, you never get data that perfectly fits on a line. So for a real line, if you fit, fit it, you have an error. So if my predictions are here, um, and the real data that I'm not testing yet would not always be on the line. So the, the, the mean squared error that's that's calculated here, and we will, again, we will go into more details on this uh, in, in uh, another week or two here. But that's basically what's being calculated here. It's a measure of how well the model, the fitted model is how close its predictions are getting to the data that you're trying to predict. So zero means I'm predicting, my regression predictions are absolutely perfect. Every data item I try to predict is exactly the value I to uh, And the bigger, the, the, the more um, error that we have. So, so the, the, the mean square error is really the sum of all of these errors. Set of 100 points, having to get error of all 100 points and sum that up. Uh, and then well, we sum and take the average. That's why it's the mean squared error. Um, all right. There's various ways you can calculate the, what, what's asked for um, on the assignment one that if you have a fitted regression model. So, uh, but most of them, you know, you do have to, you know, you, you take your model that's been trained, you use the predict function. So you give it a set of data. So, so normally we'd want to predict it on unseen data, but you can just, like, like here, again, we're just doing the predictions on the data that we trained with. So, so we're re-predicting on the data that we fit the model with. Um, but yeah, once you have your predictions uh, in various ways, I mean, you can, you can um, um, you can use this function, the mean squared error, uh, I think I think I asked for the mean squared error, the root mean squared error, for the assignment. So, so 
Although I guess kind of as, as, a, as a hint or a caveat, you know, be careful if you do use this function um, that uh, the, the, the values of, um, that you're testing with should go first and your predictions go. These, these are the, in, in this notebook, these were the labels that we trained with. Um, um, and in fact, this might be an error here. Oh, no, right. So these are the, the labels that we trained with. So, so we fit our model with the Y train data. Um, and so if we want to calculate the mean squared error, uh, we have to pass in the, the, the values that we trained with first and the, our model's predictions as the second one. If you flip those, you'll get the wrong calculate. You get the wrong score for your mean squared error um, um, on these. So. So it does make a difference which way you do on these. Um, so let me skip over. So um, uh, for the assignment, I also ask you to use STAS model. So this is just another library uh, that uh, can do things like linear and logistic regression and other kinds of statistical analysis. Um, uh, we won't use stats model uh, much in this class, but uh, I thought it was good to have kind of a comparison. So you know, scikit-learn is really geared more towards people doing uh, machine learning, uh, like in an enterprise setting where you want to build a model for like a product uh, to. Uh, do things where stats models it was built uh, by statisticians who were doing statistical analysis in more of like a formal or academic setting but you know you can do similar things so um, 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 so to do like a regression model uh, the the usual convention is to just uh, import the the stats model API as something that has all the things that we need um, so um, again, this will make more sense when we look at the actual details of how linear regression works. Uh, but stats model, because of the way st statisticians normally do this, by default, it doesn't uh, create a constant for the intercept in the data here. So you actually have to add it by hand in order to get the same linear regression model that you would get for, for the default of scikit-learn. So that was that parameter that I was pointing out. Uh, you can get the same behavior in scikit-learn by changing that parameter from false to true that you would get as the default uh, for stats model. But normally the way that we think of a linear regression, we do think of it as having the intercept term in there. So uh, for your data, you have to actually add it by hand when you're doing the stats model, both for the linear regression and the logistic regression. For your assignment too. So what that does, if you look at the result of this, um, um, I should have shown this before here. So let me. Uh, so if I rerun this, uh, so this is what our, our data frame X looks like after we drop those. Um, so we have. Um, uh, we have the what one two three four. We have five features with those values in there. Average income, house age, uh, area, average area, or average number of rooms, um, so on. Right. So when you add this constant, all it does is add in another feature. So this is the one that's used for the uh, the intercept term when you're fitting a model. Right, and, and all the values are one. So you can actually do that pretty easily by hand. Just add a new column to the, the data frame and put ones in there, but there's a, um, there's a function that does that for you. Right? Um, but you know, the point is that the, the linear regression um, uh, won't give you the same results as scikit-learn's linear regression without doing that by hand before you fit your model, fit and train your model. Right? Um, Anyway, so uh, ordinarily squared is kind of another name for what linear regression is doing. So it's fitting the best line that has the, the least squared error. Um, um, 
But if you do this here and you do this for your assignment, you should find you know, we fit, we get exactly the same model. So if you compare the, this is the intercept term that scikit-learn have had, and these are the coefficients. These are the, the parameters for each of the, uh, the features. You should be getting exactly the same fitted model parameters um, from this uh, stats model um, as you do for the scikit-learn uh, linear regression. Uh, pretty, I, I, we could go back up and, and look at those, but those should all be exactly the same as these coefficients and intercept that we had up here. Uh, the, the ones that we displayed right here. Um, and, um, you know, I do ask you to also bring up the, the summary. Uh, we'll talk more about this later on when we get into uh, the details of how linear regression works uh, in this class in uh, another week or two. Uh, but this has some nice stuff. But this is also the same. Uh, this column here is the fitted uh, coefficients. So, so the intercept term and then the, the fitted coefficients for each of the features plus extra information that you don't get from scikit-learn. For example, the 95% uh, confidence interval for the fit and other stuff. So this is the kind of stuff that statisticians like to know about a, a model like this. Um, what's the confidence interval of my fit and things like that. Um, also, for example, the uh, I think I do ask you to, 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 to give the R squared score. So, um, um, didn't I give an example of doing that? So that's another score that has some similarity to the uh, the, the mean squared error, it's a, it's a measure, again, of how well, how good the fit was uh, for the data. Um, yeah, apparently, I didn't show it, but, but yeah, I did ask on the assignment to calculate the R squared, calculate and return the R squared score as well. So, um, so you'll have to find that, that function both in scikit-learn and in um, stats model. But yeah, on the summary, you can see it on the summary, but there's a way to pull that out as well from the model, as well as, as a way to pull out the params and things um, uh, when you're doing a, a stats model. Um, okay, and then let's go back to logistic regression. So... Um, so back to the logistic regression so I can learn. So uh, the second part of the assignment uh, that you're working on right now, um, uh, we use the same data, but we use a different column um, and try to make a, um, a classification model using logistic regression. Um, so like in this one, on this one we, we switched to a different data set in this example. So uh, the MNIST data set we will use many times in the textbook and in this class. Um, so if you don't know what that is, uh, this um, is a set of data where it's really image data. Um, so uh, the, the images are um, um, uh, is it eight by eight pixels? I guess eight by eight pixels. I was thinking it was a little bit different, but but, but you have images of handwritten digits. Uh, that have been digitized. So usually in the, 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 the task is, um, this, this is a classification task, although it's not binary classification. So given the image, we wanted to predict, you know, is that a, a zero digit or one digit? So it's a multi-class classification where the output is one of 10 classes, zero through nine. So we'll use this, this data set a lot. Uh, it has some historical significance in machine learning and neural networks, uh, uh, people doing stuff with this MNIST uh, data set. Um, but in, in terms of, of you know, using it, um, um, I mean, it works pretty much the same way. Uh, you know, you, you 
create a model from scikit-learn that does classification. So logistic regression will do classification for you, even though the name might suggest otherwise. Uh, you do need to um, specify some metaparameters to get the results that we're looking for for the assignment, but I, 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 met, I, I gave those to you of what you should be using, so which solver you should be using and uh, how much um, regularization you should be using to get the expected results. So I'll bring up the assignment here uh, in a moment. Um, but given that, so, you know, the, the difference being that we're here, our training labels, um, first 10 of these, but they're basically a categorical variable, right? So, so that's any model that does classification would expect this to be um, you know, a categorical variable sometimes. Zero, zero through nine in this case that we're trying to build a model of. Uh, but yeah, besides that, I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff is similar. Um, in this case, our, uh, if we look at like the X, the inputs, um, Oh, that was my old X, so let's see here. We're using, what, X train here. Um, so we, we kind of flattened the, um, the, uh, the, the pixels. So really there's 1,347 samples with 64 features, but the, each feature is a value for the pixel. Um, and we're actually using grayscale um, uh, on this data set, so, so the, each pixel, like we could look at one of these, so let's look at like say the zeroth row, um, the zeroth pixel. Um, so it's going to be zero, let's see if I can find one that's more interesting, I have to probably go somewhere in the middle, so let's say like about uh, the 32nd pixel. at all of them. But, but yeah, it's, it's really a grayscale value, so it should range from like 0 to 255 um, for each one of those, if I remember right. Um, okay, but, but anyway, um, um, so that, that's, that's what we're fitting here. Um, and and um, Um, so, oh, and that's why we get, you know, we still have one intercept term, but we have, since we have 64 features, we actually have 64 coefficients. So these were the, the, the coefficients should be for every one of the um, 64 p pixels in our 8x8 eight eight, uh, images here that we have. Um, So, um, oh, um, yeah, it was a little bit wrong. So we've, we've actually got 10, uh, we've got one uh, set of parameters for each one of the classes that we have. And inside of each one of those, there should be 64 uh, coefficients. So, so um, when we talk about classification models, uh, actually this week, uh, this is brought up in the, the chapter for this week. Uh, so. If, if, if you're doing something that's multi-class, so instead of binary classification, one way to do that is I build a binary classification for each one of my classes. So that's kind of what's happening uh, um, uh, here behind the scenes. Is so when we fit this model, we actually are, are getting 10 individual classifiers, one, for, uh, one to predict zero or not zero, one to predict one or not one, and so on. So we've got 10 set of 64 um, coefficients uh, here for each of the ten uh, uh, binary classes that were built um, from this model here. Um, um, 
but um, um, I ask you to do a couple of, so you have some examples of things like uh, to, to do like a confusion matrix. So uh, this is also um, the stuff that we're talking about this week when we're talking about classification. So one of the, the, the first easiest tools to, to get a sense of how well your classification model is doing is to uh, compute the confusion matrix. Um, so this is going to be telling me for each row uh, what the correct um, class was. Uh, and, and then what my predictions were, uh, you know, uh, what my model predicted. So the diagonal is all my correct prediction, prediction. So for the zeros, I predicted correctly 43 times, and it would be zero. Um, I, I, I might have this reversed, uh, hopefully I got this right. So like for the, the ones, um, I predicted 36 times it was one, but uh, one time I predicted it was two. That's kind of basically what the confusion matrix is, is doing here. And so the more stuff you have on the off diagonal, the more um, uh, error that you're having on your multi-class uh, classifier here. Um, oh, but yeah, for your assignment two, we're just doing a binary classification. So you can do a confusion matrix, but it's much simpler. It's just a two by two when you, uh, when you look at your confusion matrix for a binary classifier. So you get your true positives and true negatives, and then your false positives and false negatives. Um, so, um, uh, one kind of final note. So I, I think I also did ask you to visualize the decision boundary. Uh, again, you might not, you know, uh, quite understand what we're doing with this, but but we will get into what it means for a classification model like this, what the decision boundary is. But essentially, uh, in a similar way that we did here, uh, you're going to have, have two parameters. You're going to have two coefficients. Um, so let me call that um, feature one coefficient and feature two coefficient. So these are like the slope. Um, for the thing. So you can actually uh, figure out your line here by using your two coefficient values times feature one. That makes sense? I, I don't know, right? But uh, you have the coefficient times your feature one, uh, your coefficient times uh, the feature two, plus your intercept term. So from that equation, you can figure out what the decision boundary was on your line. So basically, when you visualize that, um, you'll have some that are like a, a no ring. I use X for no's, uh, and you have some for, for yes ring. Um, you can use uh, O for yes. Uh, and this thing will give you a line, which is which for a logistic regression um, is the decision boundary. So everything on one side of the line and the predictions that it should know, and everything on the other side of the line and the predictions for yes. So that, that's, that's, what the, that's what these coefficients are doing. They're defining this decision boundary. Um, and uh, if you visualize that, uh, things on one side or the other are for a binary classifier are the, uh, where we'll make our predictions of yes or no. So hopefully I, I, I you know, gave enough information, but, but if you do that by hand, you should be able to use that same idea, that formula with your coefficients and your intercept to figure out what your line is um, of, of, um, in your model there. Okay. Um, And then, yeah, finally, uh, on this one, um, um, there is also an example of logistic regression with stats model. So the same kind of thing. Um, um, just just be careful to um, um, to um, add your constant when you do the logistic regression model using the stats model. Um, um, and yeah, it's called uh, uh, the but the, the name that you'll need um, is this. Um, 
the MN legit, which has a meaning in statistics, uh, that's, but that's basically the logistic regression. Um, but you should get a similar result. In this case, you should be able to just use the, um, the, the default parameters. For, you'll need to specify something for scikit-learn for the logistic regression, but everything else um, you shouldn't have to specify or override the default parameters um, uh, for this assignment anyway. So. Um, Oh yeah, I should fix this this example. Yeah, it has some problems converging actually, which is a little bit strange. But uh, the MNIST data set is used a lot, but it's still it's, it's relatively um, not straightforward to build a model with that. So um, so yeah, this this notebook I gave you might not be converging um, on the uh, stats model um, uh, when it does a logistic regression here. So. Um, but your your assignment one should shouldn't have a problem uh, when it fits the model uh, on this one for assignment two. Um, let me let me bring up the assignment see if I missed anything. So let's let's close this off and go to the actual assignment here. So. Let's see if I still have it up in my uh, in my uh, containers. So, I guess this one. So yeah, um, I've noticed that it, some, it, it does just append to that output file. So if you don't find the most recent one, if you if you're redoing these containers, uh, you'll get um, you won't get the right token and won't let you log in. So you do have to find the very last one. Um, uh, Yeah, so uh, I did want to kind of show this. So, you know, I did ask you to do a little bit of plotting and visualization, right? So I asked you to once to, to first plot the data, uh, and then after you um, um, uh, build your model to actually plot the data, replot the same data uh, and show the line. Uh, this is this is exactly the figure you should end up getting, uh, exactly the same fit line if you, you know, follow uh, everything that was asked uh, for doing the scikit-learn. Uh, linear regression fit. So you get a line with that slope uh, and that uh, intercept, right? So in some sense that we'll learn about later, this is the best line. This is the line that minimizes the error uh, fitting um, the temperature feature to the evaporation uh, that we were trying to predict um, uh, for this first one here. Um, So yeah, uh, let's see here. So you know, I ask you to do that with scikit learn, uh, and you do have to, um, um, like I talked about last time, you do have to on um, this part here. Uh, basically, the the code for building the scikit learn linear regression actually goes into this function. So I should be building the model, uh, returning the model, but also extracting. So I ask you to get the intercept, the the slopes are those coefficients. Uh, the mean squared error, the root mean squared error, and also that R squared value. Return all those. Those just all get tested to make certain you're getting exactly the model that you should um, um, if you fit this, the, the data asked for here. Um, um, and same for stats model and similar idea. So there's another uh, uh, function where you should be putting in your work to get the stats model uh, and this 
and in this case, just return the uh, the model and the pram. So, if it's, if it's not clear, um, I mean, you know, I do it slightly differently just because it's it's easy for Stats model to to extract the prams with one function call, right? So, so for like scikit learn, um, there's there's two parameters uh, in order to get the intercept uh, and the coefficients, but in Stats model, um, there's just one parameter or one function call that um, returns all the parameters, the, the, the slope and the intercept parameters um, as one. That, that, but that's what's being expected uh, to be returned from this here. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, in the second, second one, um, similar setup, uh, but we're doing a classification this time. The second part of the assignment, uh, using scikit-learn and stats model, um, now you do have to do a little bit of data cleaning um, and some encoding, so using an ordinal encoder. Um, um, but yeah, we are trying to predict the rain tomorrow. Uh, using, uh, what was it? Sorry, I was. Um, um, I thought I, ex I I did explicitly specify which features to use, right? If not, I'll check on that. I'm not seeing it immediately here. So there's there's two features that you use as input. I'm trying to predict the the rain tomorrow. Oh, that's, yeah, so, so that's described down here at the second part. So on the second part is where we do a little bit of, of, of yeah, which features to pull out and then do a little bit of cleaning as well, so uh, fix some missing data and stuff like that. Um, um, and then, yeah, finally, so I mentioned it, but I did also ask you to uh, visualize the results here. Um, uh, or, well, I ask you to first just visualize the data. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, I do want something on this part. I, I did give you a figure for this. So I do want something on the first part that basically is the same as this, but without the decision boundary. Right? So you should create a plot that uses two different kinds of markers um, um, and is showing you know, our two features that we're using, which was the sunshine and the pressure. Um, um, but, but yeah, we use the marker type and, color, and or color uh, to indicate which class it is, so rain or no rain um, on your plot. And then here, do this with the decision, uh, putting in the decision boundary after you fit a model. Um, and, and yeah, I gave more hints than I thought about that. So, so it was a little bit wrong on that. But yeah, it should look something like that there. So it's really, given your coefficients, the, the equation of that decision boundary is something like that. Um, um, and if you fit those in, you can figure out then um, um, if you plot, if you uh, again, it should be a, a linear decision boundary, so you really only need two points. So you can plot your decision boundary at zero and at 14 to figure out your decision boundary line um, uh, when you want to visualize it here. So. Okay. But yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten, but I'd kind of given out sort of this, since we haven't really covered that yet, um, there is uh, the, what you need there, I think, uh, in order to figure out how to calculate what that decision boundary is that was created by your model here. So, um, all right, so um, yeah, it was a little bit longer than I was thinking, but uh, that's probably about all I'm going to talk about for the assignment two. Unless you have some questions, I mean, we still have one more class meeting, so I can take questions on Thursday as well. Um, but yeah, I encourage you, you know, if you haven't started, 
you know, make certain that you, that you get started on it. Um, see if you can see if, if anything is not making sense or not. If you're going to need to ask some questions to get some stuff clarified, I know a lot of people have already uh, gotten the first task done and, and are working on stuff. So, so hopefully you all won't have too much problem with the this assignment here. Um, okay, so. Let's maybe just look at some new stuff here for a little bit. Actually, in the time I have left, why don't we go ahead and finish off the um, um, uh, the stuff that we didn't quite get to last time. So, so let's look at the the, the one from the. Uh, previous unit about building a model with that California housing data that we had uh, real quickly here. Probably won't get through the whole thing, but um, So, at the end of last week, we had kind of gone through um, um, the exploration and the cleaning. So there was a little bit about the, the training and, and the tuning here uh, from this chapter from our hands-on machine learning. Um, so... Let's see where to start. So I, I was, yeah, maybe I won't skip over this. Um, this is this is all useful stuff here. So there's a little bit of a discussion in this chapter about using some of the more uh, I don't know advanced kinds of, of things for creating uh, like a data analysis and a data cleaning pipeline. Um, so let's. Uh, Let's maybe mention those uh, real quickly. Um, so some of the stuff that was talked about, um, so often what happens in a real machine learning project is once we figure out, you know, what we want to do to clean data, um, uh, impute things, uh, maybe build new features, we want to be able to reproduce that at need whenever we need to, right? So we don't want to be, we want to try to not be doing stuff by hand, right? So. The, the mechanism that, that Scikit-Learn provides for that are these ideas of, of these pipelines. Um, so uh, there's some examples. Um, I won't be able to go into details of these, but um, so this is a little bit of what I mentioned before is that you can use duct typing to uh, actually create your own classes that you can put into these sorts of pipelines. So you can sort of by hand uh, do different kinds of cleaning or imputing. So in this example, we're using the uh, scikit-learn. Uh, so, so we're uh, uh, inheriting from the base estimator uh, and the transformer. These are two scikit-learn kinds of classes. Uh, so all we have to really implement are like the uh, fit and the transform methods of these, uh, and then we can use this in uh, one of these kinds of scikit-learn pipelines. Um, um, so in this case, we don't really have to do anything for fit, but all we're doing on the transform that this was discussed is we're really, we're kind of adding in um, some new attributes that we didn't have in the original data that, uh, that uh, if you did the readings on this chapter, uh, were uh, proposed that it might work better than uh, the, the features that we originally have. So adding in an attribute for the number of rooms on average that we have per household and the number of people that we have in, in our household. Um, um, and also this one, this one can uh, add a third feature if we need to, uh, bedrooms per room. So we have uh, rooms per household, um, and I can't remember exactly why it's not bedrooms per household, but similar kind of idea here. Um, 
the point on this, you know, just one thing to, to point out is kind of notice what the transformer is doing is we, we get an original data frame and what this particular uh, uh, thing that we're going to add for the um, uh, for in a pipeline is we want to add in new features. So basically we want to add in new columns to the data frame. So that's what the transform does. So we're given the data frame that we need to transform. Um, and if you look closely here, we're just using some slicing. Um, um, that, uh, so so we, we create a, a new feature, a new column by dividing that by that. Um, and, and a new uh, column here by dividing that by that. Um, and then here, and it's a little bit kind of complex, but this really creates a new NumPy array in this case, taking the original one and adding on uh, two new columns um, or three new columns, uh, depending on whether we want to also have this third feature or not. All right? So just in words, if you didn't quite understand what, what that was doing, is what we're really doing is creating a new NumPy array where we add in two or three new columns and return that. that that's what happens for this, this um, uh, this transformer here when, when the transform method is called. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, we will, you will need to use some things like this for some of our assignments. So this, this makes stuff a lot easier for recreating, uh, you know, doing um, uh, data cleaning and analysis pipelines like these. Um, so, um, so, you know, real quick, yeah, it kind of breaks this up into, we've got one separate pipeline for doing the, the cleaning or the imputing for the numeric values. We've got another one that's kind of handling the, um, uh, the, 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 the categorical variables that need to be done. Um, but uh, so I'll just show you on this one. So uh, we can just, this is really just defining a list of objects, right? So you can have a pipeline that has a list of these other uh, pipeline objects. So what happens for a pipeline like this is uh, if we call the transform on this, it'll first call like the fit transform for this first object, that will return a transformed uh, data frame or NumPy array. That transform one gets, gets pass to the next one in the pipeline and so on. So it just goes through these in sequence. So this is really just a num this is really just a Python list uh, of where each item in the list is a tuple of just a name for that pipeline step and um, an instance of one of these uh, transformer um, like objects, estimator transformer like objects here. Right. So like in this one, you know, we're using uh, some built-in classes, an imputer uh, in order to fill in values with the mean, like we showed before, um, and a scalar, which I didn't really talk about, but scaling all of our features to have a, a similar mean and uh, distribution. Uh, and we're also using the one that we built by hand in the middle of this to potentially add in some new features, some new columns to our data set. Um, So the result, if you do that, the, the why we're displaying these is, you know, before we do this, uh, we had some missing data, um, and we had like nine uh, features in our uh, housing data set here. So we can actually combine these, these two pipelines into a full pipeline that will do it all at once. Um, and then, then if we call it, um, it should do all those transformations. So do, do all of our data cleaning. Uh, oh, and, and we are doing one hot encoding. Um, I, I keep mentioning that. I haven't really talked about that. But um, um, the, just kind of quickly on that, if you have a categorical feature like we did for this data set uh, for the, the nearness to the ocean, um, for some categorical features, if there's no good ordering. So our feature, I don't know if we really need to do the one hot encoding like they did in our textbook here, but if there's no like ordering like we did for the ocean one, uh, where we have, you know, on the island, uh, I can't remember, beach, and then less than one hour, whatever, whatever they were. There's not an actual order, but sometimes you have a categorical variable where uh, it doesn't really make um, a difference. And if you 
leave it as encoded as like an integer, um, your um, uh, your models will inf will usually infer that there's more of a relationship between zero and one than there is between zero and two, and that that can have some good, well, usually bad effects on the models you build. So, so when you have categorical data that's not naturally ordered, uh, an alternative is to use a one-hot encoding. That will usually alleviate the problem. So in that case, instead of having just one column that has an integer, you know, so our distance in this categorical encoding would be like 0, 1, 2, we would have, um, uh, 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 let's say we only have three categories here. We would just have three um, columns that are one-hot encoded. So we'll call it like island, um, uh, beach, yep. and uh, less than one hour. And where, you know, so if this row was a zero, we would have a one on island, and zero, and if this was a one, it's only the, only the, the one uh, uh, that was in that category would have a one, all the others for the one hot encoder would have a zero. So that's, that's what the one hot encoder does um, on this example from the chapter from the previous week. Um, and um, that is, Depending on the type of your categorical variable, you can you can sometimes get better results using uh, that kind of encoding. It has it has some effects though because it, you know so if I have ten categories, I go from one column to ten columns. So you, you end up greatly expanding the number of features that you have to train the model with. So there's some trade-offs is all I'm trying to say. Um, um, where it, it might be better, but it might slow down things uh, for your training stuff. Um, so really, th I mean, the, I don't have too much that that would that I could really say. Uh, it does again. You know, we showed some examples. So it did show from the textbook. It showed fitting a simple linear regression model. So at this point in the course, I, all I really want you guys to be familiar with is this idea that. All the different sorts of machine learning uh, models that we'll talk about in this class, uh, we can use the same pattern, right? So um, uh, we'll just create some instance of it and we'll fit it to our data. And then after that, you can use them in the same way to make predictions or do other stuff. So whether we're, whatever, whatever kind of model we're using, linear regression, or the textbook uses some more things that we will get to later on, um, using like a decision tree. Um, as an example of something that might give a better model, that might make better predictions on this data set. Right? And the other thing that we'll need to talk more about in this class is how do you determine you know, which of these two models is better? Um, so in fact, the, the decision tree gets an, uh, gets an error of zero, so it actually perfectly fits the data. But, but yeah, if you did the readings uh, on this chapter, is that really better or not? Uh, there, there's probably this model is being overfit. So while it can perfect, perfectly predict the data that we fit with, it probably won't do very well to generalize, to, to actually make predictions on unseen data. Um, um, all right. Um, yeah, so let me go and stop there. I mean, there's a little bit more, uh, but.